Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young. Another day, another edition of the KSO Show. Continuing our preview of K-State football as we get closer and closer to kickoff. Ten days away from the home opener against UT Martin, and we sit here just a handful of days before the college football season actually gets started with Week Zero games. It's an exciting time, and the very first game of Week Zero is is going to be played in a place that K-State will be next year. The Aer Lingus College Football Classic this year's edition has Georgia Tech and Florida State playing in it. But next year, you can join your Wildcats in Ireland as they kick off the 2025 season against Iowa State in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Game tickets can be secured now through a travel or hospitality package. All-inclusive travel packages include premium game tickets, luxury hotel accommodations, an exclusive K-State welcome experience, and more. Game day hospitality packages include premium in-stadium hospitality with food and drinks and premium game tickets. Don't miss out on the trip of a lifetime. Book your package now at cats2ireland.com. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. And you can see it right there if you're watching on the YouTube as well. Uh, with the the website on the screen and uh, go check it out to get your information on how you move from uh, Hoxie, Kansas to Dublin, Ireland for the game or wherever else you might be Hoxie. in the country. Uh, that's a good pull. So wh- who you got, Knowles or Jackets? Uh, Florida State. I'm not, I, think I don't know close. that I'm buying into Georgia Tech yet. I think it would close because I, I don't know if Florida State's going to be that good early. Yeah, it'll be interesting. And well, they were a place like 18 starters. Yeah, and I know that uh Georgia Tech is very excited for for Haynes King this year. So I guess we'll see how that uh ends up working out for him. But it, I think it should be an interesting game. I mean, fortunately enough, outside of you know Notre Dame going over there and just whipping an inferior opponent, like the games that have been played over there have been, you know, somewhat competitive or interesting to see. The year, uh, the year where Northwestern that was their only win of the season, right? Yeah, that was that was a good time for me. Um, <laughs> and honestly, I got to give them props for doing that just before I left radio, so I could be on the air coming back with a Nebraska fan after that took place. Uh, just a, a fun and wild time there. So, and, and it'll be wild seeing DJ Uyunglele now with Florida State. I think I said yeah. that name right. Yeah, it sounded right, uh, and it'll be his third team. So uh, he he's played musical chairs, similar to Alan Bowman has, uh, who is on his third team. And but DJ started for all three. Alan Bowman never got the start at Michigan. No, no, he he can go on a long list of guys that ended up at Michigan and weren't very good quarterbacks, and oh. that includes some of the first ones that Jim Harbaugh started at quarterback. Because um, one he one went baseball, right? I mean, it wasn't for Jim Harbaugh, but Drew Henson. Yeah, yeah, that was a it was almost before my time. Uh, let's see. So I'm trying to think. They had like, well, I was, you know, before Joe Milton went to Tennessee, I was all aboard the Joe Milton train at Michigan. I thought that that was uh, going to work so, out. That's one of those examples. How you throw a mile over that over that roof or whatever? He's like, you could do that. Uh, I mean, John O'Corn is the one of the quarterbacks that I'm thinking that Harbaugh played that was. Not very good uh, there. Um, and there have been a handful of others that went through that weren't Funny the greatest. Too, yeah. I mean, Cade McNamara is going to get ready to start at Iowa, and uh, mm. you know J.J. McCarthy took his job out yeah. from under him. It's, it's actually, now that we know everything that's happened, funny to reflect on those first, what, three or four years of hardball when they were, well, they were either pedestrians, probably too harsh, but pedestrian by their standards, they were probably basically what Penn State has been for the last 10 years under James Franklin, where you are being everybody you should and getting smoked by everyone you shouldn't. So, and then uh, obviously, then they found the the secret sauce, which might be uh, the cheating. <laughs> yeah, that it does. Turns out it does help a little bit if you uh, if you just cheat a, your way a little. Uh, Jay Patterson, another one of those quarterbacks that Jay ended Patterson. up there. Um, oh, well, that makes me Shane Morris. Was that for Harbaugh? Or is that uh, Shane Morris would have been just before Harbaugh. He actually uh, was Lefty. the the focus of the, the Brady Hoke uh, era. The twenty, yeah, the twenty thirteen. He was uh, involved in 
the Buffalo Wild Wings Bowl where K-State beat Michigan. So all roads lead back to talking about K-State, uh, which also takes us back to the Aer Lingus College Football Classic, which is set for 2025. And uh, we are a year and two days away from that game taking place. So 367 days from now, K-State will be in Ireland taking on the Cyclones. Let's move on to things that are happening in 10 days as opposed to 367 days. And that would be talking about this K-State defense because we've talked quarterback, we've talked running back. The defense might be the next most interesting topic of this team going into the season because they've gotten so much praise and hype in the preseason buildup to it. So just like all the other days, I've got a couple of questions that I'm going to throw your way and you're going to give me your answer and what first thought comes to your head when I say it to you. So I'll just start off strong right here for you. Strong. Which position coach will have the most work to do with his unit this year? Because, you know, that there there's a lot of depth, I think, that's been brought up multiple times. But which coach is right now going through it like, man, we're 10 days away. I really got to I got to whip these guys into shape. I think I would not go with Buddy Wyatt, even though there is an argument there. Just he's like because he's got like the young studs that he needs to get ready as quickly as possible but he has a buffer with brendan mott and cody stuffleby with steve standard i don't know that especially with the first unit that he has to do a lot of coaching right i mean he's got like the oldest statesman on the team really if you combine the amount of experience and snaps that he's going to have at his disposal between austin moore and desmond purnell van malone has basically two starting cornerbacks coming back from last year and Keenan Garber and Jacob Parrish. And then Joe Klanderman at safety. He has maybe the two of the oldest players on that side of the ball. <laughs> no, it's probably Austin Moore and Brennan Mott are two of the oldest yeah. ones. But close is Jordan Riley and Marquis Siegel. Keenan Garber might be, yeah. would yeah. be yeah. one of the oldest. I mean, there's now a he's... lot of old yeah. dudes on the defensive side of the ball that give all of these guys a buffer. The one without as much buffer you can argue maybe he's got a little bit one here a little bit one there's my two Sopo, and that's the rune it's got to get a lot better from where it was last year so i would agree or i don't know if i would agree um <laughs> i don't know who else is saying it but i would go with defensive People tackle are. nose guard my two Sopo probably has the most work to do um and that's not to say that, that the position is in bad shape i don't think that it is but uso say has got to be better than he was last year and Damien Eli Leo has never really had a start before, unless it was for injury, maybe that I'm not thinking of. And and if maybe he's leapfrogging you, so maybe he's not. But you just don't have those buffers. You don't have a Brendan Mott, an Austin Moore, a Keenan Garber, a Jacob Parrish, a Marquis Siegel, a Jordan Riley, a defensive tackle. So that's why I would pick that spot. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, do you kind of a secondary question to it? Then do you think it's he has a lot of work to do, but is it a little bit easier to mask because it's a smaller group in terms of how many you're going to need to put on the field or will be necessary at times? Like, I guess you're right. I think, I think the correct answer for the way the question was worded is yes, that is the most in, like the most work to be done, but is that the most important? Like the combo of, Hey, you need to get better here, but also the team really needs you to get better in this spot. The second part might be even more true. I mean, the defensive tackle position in an odd front is becomes pretty critical. True. Now, I think there's going to be plenty of wrinkles this year where they're going to have more than maybe two defensive ends on the field at the same time, and it'll take away some of that need and priority that we're talking about. But if you're going to play an odd front, if you're going to play 3-3-5, three, three, you need your nose guard to be very disruptive. All right, that's that's fair. I, I think for me, uh, I would go... Because I, I don't know. I'm not as overly concerned about, I mean, I have worries. I think that they need to improve there. But I think in terms of what you might need is I'm I'm slightly concerned about where depth will lie behind the, the top two corners. And so I would well, put, I'm not, I'm you're not? not you I, feel I, good I, about I, him? Because I, I think Justice James, it's kind of like where – before Eli Huggins was like a super regular contributor, I remember saying, man, this guy is good every time he plays. I am a little bit surprised he doesn't play more. And each of the last two seasons, I've kind of thought that about Justice James. 
So I'm a lot higher on Justice James than most. I think he's a really good number three corner. And I'm hearing really good things about Jordan Dunbar right now coming on training camp. Well, that then that's I think maybe that's one for me. It's more about the unknown on those yeah. guys back there. But I, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll take your word for it on on Justice James. Then, You're right though. Then, it's how yeah. few times we see him out there. And Dunbar was, you know, was seemed like a nice ad at the time when they got him out of the He's portal. A pretty late. decorated player at Rice. Yeah. And then even beyond that, I mean, we know that they like these guys have some work in front of them, obviously, because they haven't played a ton of their young, but we know that they really like the prospects and the future of even can Nigel Thomas and Donovan McIntosh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, and I, I I'll still stick with it just cause I think I want I, to confirm I, I think, that the depth develops there, but I think uh, linebacker is a dark horse just because you're going through a little bit of a hiccup already with the yeah. injury stuff around Alec Marenko. It was the hard luck position last year. And for some reason, it looks like maybe it could be again, um, Asa Newsom still has to get up to speed. Terry Kirksey has been the surprise of training camp, but if Marenko isn't up to speed, then he kind of has to be. Well, and how and you're, you're relying on guys that are, are relatively young there too. You know, once you get past Moore and Purnell, you're looking at guys that like, it seems like Austin Romaine is going to win out the mic job, but he's going to be a true sophomore. Yeah. Uh, and then you're looking, Asa Newsom is coming off injury. was a true freshman last year. And Terry Kirksey, a guy that you know has hasn't played a lot played. of college football, but hasn't played any of it at this level. You know that all came at HCC, sure, of course. So. I, I I still tend to not because even though what's happened with Marenko has happened at this point, and he's had some hard luck since arriving. I think Austin Romain turning into a dude is very possible, and I think last year is probably really beneficial to him. So th- that alleviates some concern. And it really sounds like he's taking the bull by the horns right now. Uh, it's how much do you believe in the progression of Terry Kirksey? Uh, I think that matters here. And how much you believe in Asa Newsom being better than they thought he would be at this point. I think that matters here too. And some of it is masked. You talk about masking. Is masked that you have Austin Moore and Desmond Purnell. Yeah. They cover up warts. They do. They do. It's good to have linebackers like those two that, are typically just all over the place. Uh, next question, similar in in the line of questioning to which coach has the most work to do, and I assume I know where your answer might be now, but in what way do you think K-State could be exploited? Uh, their defense kind of be, I don't know, hung out to dry or exposed a little bit this year, uh, whether that be you know in a specific type of the run or pass or attacking a certain guy. Where do you think – exploitation can happen to this K-State defense, which again, might be tough to do because this is this is shaping up to be a really good group. I mean, the the energy and enthusiasm for this K-State defense, I'll have uh, a, a question about it in a little bit, but it, it seems like this group is going to be really good and the coaches and the players are confident in it. But if there's one spot where they could be exposed, where is it? Yeah, I think they have the best secondary in the Big 12. So stopping the the pass should be a strength. You have an, a now you have some question marks in terms of rushing the passer, but it should still be better than last year. And you have some really upside to maybe perhaps be very good at it. If one of those defensive ends that's pretty young can really come on. But when you have now, it's not to say that this is going to happen, but when there's avenues to of you being a little skittish at the linebacker spot a little skittish at the interior defensive tackle spot, then I, I think you got to worry maybe about, you know, the running game between the tackles and, and how you will, you'll react, react to that. What I will say is as long as you're preventing explosive plays, I would much rather be a better pass defense than a run defense in this era of football. Yeah. It, okay. it, it was, and I'll be honest. I, and I know it's, not apples to apples. The college game is not similar to the NFL game, but the Kansas City Chiefs just won another Super Bowl last year and were perhaps, they, not perhaps, they were one of the best, probably two, three, four best defenses in the entire NFL. They couldn't stop the run, but because they didn't give up explosive plays and were elite in pass defense, it didn't matter. Well, and I would, you know, I, I don't want it, people are probably like, oh, this is not the most fun of examples. But when we talk about this, think of the Oklahoma State game last year. 
and how that ended up playing out. I mean, Ollie Gordon was 136 yards on the ground in that game. We know Oklahoma State ended up winning 29-21. But if you go back and, and look through, K-State's defense, they did a good job of standing up when they needed to. And the only offensive touchdown in the game for Oklahoma State came with 7.54 on the clock in the first quarter. After that, it was field goal, field goal, pick six, field goal, field goal, field goal. So you could make the argument, hey, that you gave up a lot of scoring drives. You probably don't want to, you know, you can get field goal to death in, in football sometimes, which if you're allowing a team to kick five field goals, that's probably going to happen to you. But the defense did a good enough job of giving somewhat of an opportunity to K-State there. And I think that's where you look at it and say, okay, they can improve upon that. And we saw as the, the season moved on, they ended up being uh, really strong in that, even despite having those moments where you might have felt like they were getting gashed. So uh, you're right. You can kind of cover up some of that for the most part. And eventually, as long as you're not giving up big touchdown runs and you're kind of containing a team to inside the 15 or 10 yard line, it gets a lot easier to defend the run and then also a shorter field for the offense to work with. It can help a little bit more if you're a good enough defense. And also we know just how good at this that Joe Klanderman is. So K-State can bow up when they need to. Uh, so I, I think uh, everything you said is pretty spot on. Now, my next question for you, this is a positive, so I don't want people thinking all this is uh, like negativity coming your way. This safety group, in terms of the positional depth and strength that it has, you've been covering K-State since 2017. In your time, do you think that there has been a better position group than the way that this safety group of 2024 is setting up? Whether that be trying to think of what the best example would be for you. I mean, the, the some of the offensive lines probably would be in the, the, the conversation for that. Um, running back in 2022, you know, you had Deuce Vaughn and DJ Giddens. That's pretty good. Running back this year will be really good. But in, in your mind, I, hey, well, what, and what in terms of what we were thinking going into a season, not maybe necessarily the way that it played out, quarterback last year. I yeah. Mean, you have Will Howard and Avery Johnson. I mean, two people that everyone is considering a Heisman Trophy contender at this point. I think you basically had two two Heisman Trophy contenders, I guess, in, in your quarterback room. I think that's on the table. Maybe some of those offensive lines. I mean, last year's offensive line, um, but maybe it didn't come to fruition because you lost Duffy a little bit. So maybe that one year before, but then some of those guys weren't as good. Like last year's KT Leviston was really good. Yeah. So those come to mind. Your DN room when you had Felix with Brendan Mott, Khalid Duke, and Nate Matlack. I mean, I think that's who was playing DN at the time, or though Khalid yeah. Duke might have been a linebacker. Maybe you thought last year at linebacker when you had Daniel Green, Austin Moore, and Desmond Purnell. Maybe that's up there. And then obviously you have the worst luck imaginable at that position. So it doesn't necessarily materialize. You know, the year. They won the Big 12 title. Just that defensive line in general, right? Yeah. I mean, Eli Huggins, Damian Eli Leo gets in as the fourth. I mean, they were, they were deep that year. I'm I'm looking at it right now. Like, here's the defensive line from 2022. Yeah. Felix, Brendan Mott, Khalid Duke, Nate Matlack, Jalen Pickle, uh, Robert Hintz, Eli Huggins. Uh, and then you mentioned like Damian Elio and Uso were all involved in plays like when they needed it. I mean, Damian uh, Elio and Uso, just because they had so much bad luck at that position in the Big 12 title, I think those two were playing in the Big 12 title game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know Uso for sure was in on the goal line stand. I think Eli Leo, I think Eli Leo, Leo was because Eli Huggins, I think, got hurt or hence got hurt. Something happened. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, they 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 had a cycle through there. I, that's probably if we're if we're going broad, that's it, probably it, the group also that could going, rival the state. Yeah, and if we're also going off productivity and not necessarily just preseason projection, so we have the benefit of hindsight. That defensive line was really good in twenty twenty two. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I think going into a season, this safety group kind of shows that they 
are probably the best. And then also uh, we'll see how it plays out by the end of the year. Some of those quarterback rooms are good. Uh, like Juju Alex and- Delton, Skylar what? Thompson. No, corner. Uh, oh, Echo- corner, corner, yeah. Corner. Yeah, Echo Boy Doe, Julius Brent. Yeah. Uh, and then who did you have as the backups to those before Willie got there and all those guys got there? Um, So, so Jacob basically- Parrish would have been one of the guys in there as a, as a freshman in 2022. Yeah. Um, there was a number three. Yeah, uh, for some reason, I'm missing. But yeah, I'm trying yeah. to think uh, off the. I mean, Keenan Garber was playing by yeah, the time. Keenan Garber but... got in, got in there as well. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's certainly an option that that would be in the mix there, uh, for that group. So yeah, but I the just... safeties, Yeah, but I mean, to your point, the safety group, assuming the the second team kind of materializes, which I have no reason to think that it won't. I really like Colby McAllister. Yep. I think Kendrick Steiger can be good. Obviously, they've had high hopes for Jack Faber since he arrived. But assuming those guys materialize, I mean, there is nothing, nothing to be deterred from when you're looking at the starting unit. Like, I know that there's really good safeties across the league, like Jeremiah Cooper at Iowa State. I know a lot of people like him. I think Utah's got one. And obviously... I don't know every team like the back of my hand and, and who else made the all big 12 team at safety. I know every other, there are some teams that have one guy, one stud that they really like. I mean, the, the Kansas state's uh, that's three studs. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, next, next question for you. Uh, give me your best guess at leaders for these three categories this year, interceptions, sacks, and tackles. I think I know where you will go on tackles. Uh, that one might, or well, unless you got a surprise for me. Tackles, I would be torn at tackles between, I, mean, I guess, all three linebackers, really. Um, it probably just depends on which one you think they rotate less. And mm. So do you do you want a little context to the, the tackle? Uh, situation what, was was Austin Moore like way ahead last year? Austin Moore w- had the most, but he was tied with somebody for the most on last year's team, and it was not another linebacker. It, it was, was not another oh, linebacker. It was, it was probably dude. It's a back of all the explosive plays to give up last year. It was Marquis Siegel. Yeah, well, one Siegel did play close to the line of scrimmage because of the free safety. They played yep. really, you know, press man coverage at the line of scrimmage, or they're really active in the run game. But also, that's also because Kansas State was so bad at allowing explosive plays that he had to be the one running 30 yards backward to make the tackle. Hopefully, that doesn't happen again. If one of these defensive backs is leader in tackles again, then obviously they probably haven't corrected the issue. That's how I would feel. Yeah. Um, I guess you probably should go Austin Moore again. I'm a little surprised Desmond Purnell wasn't up there. I guess maybe he's close because that's uh, yeah, someone he- I kind of want to go with. He was fifth last year, and he was the second highest non DB uh, because behind Moore and Siegel, it was VJ Payne and Kobe Savage, uh, and then yeah. just and but then behind him, it was Parrish and Will Lee uh, before you had a, a drop off to having the corners the there. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, you, teams were trying to run wide on them too. That means I kind of yeah, I kind of want to go Purnell. I don't know. Maybe that feels like more of a gut instinct than really what the context and evidence necessarily suggests. No, I, Austin Moore is probably your best bet. But. Yeah, I think Austin Moore is probably the the easy answer there. But I do think there's a world in which like Des Purnell can supersede him in in what's done back there, and it's just going to depend Purnell, on Purnell plays more coverage than Moore. That's too. the thing too. Yeah, so, so that that helps more out that he's in coverage less than Purnell. So, and then remain, if the pro, the thing is also the, the way that it went, the pecking order last year in tackles, because there wasn't a middle linebacker that like started more than six games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you go through and you look, uh, you could, I guess Clifton. you could add up, it was green. you could it was add up the middle linebackers, uh, like Clifton, oh. Romain and green and Palmer. Yeah. And Palmer, uh, that number would be so Clifton Palmer's 49, and then 22 for Romaine, that gets you to 71, and then Green gets you to 84. So those guys together combined for 84, uh, out of that spot. 
but so Romain could get close if he starts like ten games. Yeah, so maybe that's a that's another good answer. Interceptions. It feels like the easy answer is Siegel, but Jacob Parrish had four last year. And yeah, I, to be honest, I've struggled to remember some of them. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think what games that they would have been in. Uh, well, but one did one of them come against Troy maybe uh, last year. Now, he's know, a really I, sticky corner, so if teams challenge him because he is so fast and his start and stop ability is so good, like he's always around the wide receiver. Like he doesn't get beat and their separation is rarely there. So as long as he keeps getting challenged, he has a lot of opportunities to get interceptions, much like Marquis Siegel. That's more him being in the right spot at the right time because he's such a good player. Not that Parrish isn't, but that's why Siegel always has a chance. So I was just going to say that you weren't taking Siegel there. It tells me that you don't believe the hand hype is real. You don't think that the hands have gotten better. <laughs> no, I, I will still take Siegel. I just think that, and we've all been saying Siegel all year because yeah. if he catches like normal balls, he has like nine interceptions last year. But I just think Jacob Parrish were probably underselling. Yeah, Parrish for last year, his first game against UCF. Uh, we might be idiots for not remembering at least one of the games because he had That's two insane. against Texas, uh, oh. and then he had one against NC State. He has two against Texas because Malik Murphy was ridiculous. With yeah, the ball. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was interesting. Shout out to Duke starting quarterback Malik Murphy. Uh, oh yeah, you get, uh, named, Manny yeah. Diaz trying to trying to find lightning in a bottle. Probably a good, uh, you know, not a bad flyer. Yeah, no. If you're Duke, I feel like. The, much like other teams that are not in the top 20, right? You got to take risk like that. Yeah. Uh, sacks. This is the one I, I, oh. I've talked about it. Uh, I think fan drew and I talked about it on Sunday and it was, okay, I'm like, going to give there could be five answer. guys tied yeah. with like three or four for the league. You could, but I'll go. I'm going to say my answer first. And I would like to hear what fan and drew. I think I know what drew did being around him as long as I have. <laughs> But fa and fan, it's also because fan thinks the game in a different way. That sometimes is like eye opening, so mm -hmm. um, that's why he's a good listener on these shows. Yeah, believe it or not, he said Titus Tuiasa Sopo, and I, I uh, said that yeah. might be, that I, might I, be a bold I'm statement. Going, I'm, and this is a this is going to sound like a boring pick, but I promise you, it doesn't mean it has to be boring. And I think it is a wise one. I'm going Brendan Mott. The last time there was this much pass rushing talent on the Kansas State roster. Brendan Mott had like seven or eight sacks that season. So I think he's a good choice. And yeah. and think about it this way, too. And I know this is the way you think, so maybe you're leaning Mott, too. The safest way is the guy to pick the guy that will get the most snaps. And Brendan Mott's yeah. probably going to get the most snaps. Yeah, I think we all ended up on Mott. I can't remember exactly the way that it ended up going. I wish, you know. I wish I could tell you, yeah, they went. I don't think, I think Mott was the, the fun, and the fun pick would be Toby Osinsami, but I just don't think he's going to get enough snaps. I'm yeah, not, we talked about him. He's one of the guys that he will dictate how much he's on the field this year. Like, yeah, I don't can, know if he's just pass rush specialist, which is actually the language that Buddy White used. It's like, does he have enough opportunities to be yeah. that guy? Travis Bates is maybe a good secondary pick here. Because Buddy White said something about him being the best interior pass rusher. So if that's the case, then he's more than a one down player, probably. Yeah. Um, just like Brendan Mott, who was, you know, the language used for him was he can do it all. So, you know, Mott's more than a one down player. Travis Bates is more than a one down player. And someone that, you know, I will say, you kind of sometimes you got to go with the taste of the town. And lately, that's Ryan Davis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, final question for you. Which opponent do you think gives K State's defense the toughest time this season? Uh, some good options out there. Arizona will have a. I said today uh, in the story I was writing, they have the best quarterback receiver combo in mm -hmm. the league uh, with Fafita and McMillan. And then we know that KU has basically skill position talent out there wazoo uh, for what they'll throw at you if Jalen Daniels is healthy. Colorado obviously has uh, a very talented combo with Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter. Uh, and then Oklahoma State has Ollie Gordon, Brennan Presley. Um, so some opportunities there. Which offense gives the K-State defense the toughest time this season? I'll just say this right off the bat. Because of my 
perceptions of some of these teams and when Kansas State plays them. One of the reasons why I'm really high on the Kansas State defense is because I don't know that there's an offense that really terrifies the crap out of me if I'm Kansas State. Because with Tulane, who can have a good offense, and Arizona, who could have an exceptional offense, you have new coaching staffs in their first two or three weeks of the season, yeah. which I just don't think they're hitting on all cylinders at that point. And especially Arizona, when you have to combine that they're playing a Big 12 game, even though it doesn't count as a Big 12 game, for the first time ever and on the road and on a Friday. That's just, that throws Arizona all out of whack. Like, that game is a shock to the to their system of what they've been for 30 years. They got to go on the road, they got to play on a Friday, and they got to play a Big 12 team because they're now in a Big 12 conference, even though it's not a conference game. So yeah. I just don't, I like Arizona's offense. I just don't ex- expect them to be nearly at their best that game. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, I I I, I agree with you on on the Arizona and Tulane situation because I'm the same way. Where I just think new staffs working in, uh, there's going to be some things that you have to work out, and especially in the case of well, I think the talent gap between K State and Tulane factors into this, and then I think the road game Friday night aspect helps K State get a leg up on Arizona, who by the end of the year, I mean, I think those will be two comparable offenses in terms of their total production. Oklahoma State under Mike Gundy, um, 2020 notwithstanding, although they weren't great offensively that day either, have not been good in Manhattan. And I love Ollie Gordon, but outside of him, it's just in their offensive line. It's just not like an offense that like stresses you, right? It's not like complicated. They are what they are. And again, Oklahoma State has struggled in Manhattan in recent years under Mike Gundy. Um, I, I still should Colorado is dangerous offense too. They, they can be explosive, but it still feels like the, the culture versus lack of culture game that just doesn't scare me, even though maybe it should Kansas, you get at home. I'm just, that's probably the right answer, but there, there's a part of me that has like this block with Jeff Grimes that he's not as good as Andy Kotal Nikki. And I lose that. They lose me a little bit on that. Yeah. Iowa State's a little bit like Oklahoma State. They can be good, and they can test you, and they can beat the crap out of you like they did last year to Kansas State. But it's also like just the design and the the way the offense is, it's just like it's not fancy enough for me to like be scared. Because of the weapons on offense, the timing of the game, and the location of the game, I think it's West Virginia, and I don't even like West Virginia. But Garrett Green, if you look at his numbers last year, now granted, I've been a – I beat the drum on this. They beat two bowl teams. and It was just Texas Tech and UCF. The only two bowl teams they played. They played two teams in the top 35 of the F-plus anal- analytics, which is like a combination of SP-plus and Brian Fremo's FEI. Two teams in the top 35. They get their asses beat by both by three touchdowns. So West Virginia's um, quality and caliber is certainly inflated by what they – got handed on a silver platter last year in terms of a schedule standpoint. But Garrett Green's numbers were still outstanding, almost 3,500 total yards. I think he had 7,800 rushing yards alone. Um, just a great season. They're running backs. That two-headed monster of C.J. Donaldson and who's the other one? Is it Jaheim White, I want to say? Um, but two outstanding running backs. Uh, Neil Brown, known for offense. The game is in Morgantown. Um, off your back-to-back road games there because you had Colorado the week before, a game that their Kansas State's probably going to get up for because it's Coach Prime and the Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter. And then after West Virginia with no bye week in between, you got to go to KU. Just that West Virginia game spells doom for Kansas State every single way you look at it. And I don't even like West Virginia. I think that's a good answer that that you gave right there. Uh, so I I I think that's uh, that'll be a fun one for everybody uh, once they've heard it. They go oh, the okay. one game that I think you're not going to this season is like the dangerous one. Yeah, well maybe I know something that you guys. Hey, don't. Yeah, yeah. There, no. okay, hopefully we'll go eleven and zero with you in attendance. Then. I think it'll be interesting. Uh, my pick for this would probably be. Would probably be Iowa State. That's another one where 
I just think the 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 timing of that game, and yeah. I know we had it last year. I I know we had it last year with the blizzard, and both teams still I'm scored saying. about fifty points. But I think it's more like twenty twenty two, to be honest, where it's ten yeah. to nine. Yeah, I don't know that that one will just be interesting. I mean, I think Rocco Beck is a one of the better quarterbacks in this league in a league that is loaded with good quarterbacks and running backs. He's got really strong weapons at receiver. Um, and then we'll see what Abu Sama actually looks like over the course of a full year and and if he still is such a boom or bust guy. Uh, but that one that one can just be a little bit concerning uh, for how it works out. Uh, the others, I think the benefit of being at home and then just some certain circumstances like I, it's pretty simple for K-State to beat Oklahoma State this year. Just find a way to finally turn Alan Bowman over. You didn't do it last year. And take care of the ball. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and you got burnt the other way in a crazy uh, bad way. So, yeah, I, 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 I would go Iowa State. West Virginia is a, is a strong answer, though. That was probably the spiciest one that you gave today. So uh, that's good to hear. But, yeah, <laughs> on a team I don't even like this year. Yeah, I know. That's uh, it's high praise. Their defense must really suck in your mind. Uh, I think West Virginia is in danger of missing a bull this year. I mean, I don't know if we've talked about it, the two of yeah. us, but but their schedule is freaking a disaster for them. Like, yeah, uh, I'll pull it up, but it's yeah, they're they're Penn State to start the season. They put Pitt, it. and Pitt's going to want to get payback. Yeah. Uh, for well, last they've year. got Nate Matlack on their roster, so <laughs> they're going to want payback. But let's just give them the benefit of the doubt. They beat Pitt, lose to Penn State. Okay, you're two and one. You're right where you want to be. But then your first five games of the Big 12 Brutal. schedule are against KU, Oklahoma State, Iowa State, K State, and Arizona. Yeah. You lose yeah, all there, five of those. There's a chance that they're in the position of who was it last year? Was it was it UCF that got put in the spot where they got dealt a ton of losses early? And then it was like you got to be perfect the rest of the way if you want to make it. Or Texas Tech was kind of in that spot and they Texas Tech they, I think and, they finished and, four and one or something to get there. And and now there's two teams on the opposite side of that. If you look at their schedule this year, yep. you're like, they're going to maybe figure it out, right? And one of those, and I don't even like this team, but if you but if you look at their schedule, you're like, you know, this team could literally be four and oh, five and oh to start the year. And it's Cincinnati. Oh, hmm, hmm. they play Pitt at home. Yep. Winnable. They won that game at Pitt last year. They play Miami, Ohio on the road. Revenge game. <laughs> They play Houston at home. Yeah. Oh, Arizona I forgot, State at I forgot home. The, I forgot the opener is a home against Towson. Yeah. So that's a four possible four and zero start when you're going to Lubbock. Yeah, and you can you can really make the case in there that they could have five wins by the time they get it ready for at Colorado at what and home against West Virginia. Um, and you're at home against TCU. Yeah. yeah. They they could you're, they could get to six wins despite the fact that I don't think that they're very good. Yeah. Um, and but, Texas Tech's another team could start five or six and zero. Oh. Yeah, Texas Tech. This this would be, this will be interesting because Tech is one of those teams that could be the hype was last year, but we were actually wrong. Because if you look at Texas Tech's schedule, same type oh, yeah. of boat. Oh yeah, well, they start the year. I'll just go through it. Abilene Christian at home win at Washington State a trap probably, but let's give them a win. Mm -hmm. Home against North Texas win three and zero oh in non con. Then you start the year. At home against Arizona State and Cincinnati in Big 12 play to go to five and no when you go to Tucson. And then you get Baylor at home after that. Yeah. Yeah. And then their remaining home games are Colorado and West Virginia. I mean, I think <laughs> Tech is is probably going to win eight games this year, maybe more. Yeah. Uh, and that's why they're a good dark horse Big 12 title contender. Yeah. They're they're looking at a favorable if, schedule. If they, as well. if they if they were to finally stay healthy at quarterback, they could be what people thought they were going to be last year. Yeah. Yeah, then that's the key for them. Key for a lot of people is staying healthy. Uh, we just talked about the K-State defense. Might be one of the better sides of the ball in the Big 12 that can sustain a little bit of, you know, a little chips and nicks to everything going on because they have some depth. They feel really good about it, and uh, we'll get to see it all in 10 days. So that will do it for us today. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching and listening to the KSO Show. If you want more on the Wildcats, head over to On3. Become a member of K-State Online. Get great information on recruiting, the current team, and everything else going on with football and basketball around the Cats, not to mention uh, a great community to chat with 
over on our premium message board. So that will do it for us today. Back again tomorrow. It is the recruiting update of the week with Drew Galloway. He will be back. He's got some really exciting news about what we originally thought might not be the most fun recruiting weekend for K-State. So more on that tomorrow. And then D.Y. and I are back on Friday for your Wildcat headlines before the next time we talk to you, which will uh, be game week. And get ready for UT Martin and hearing from Chris Kleiman next Monday. So we are out of here. Talk to you again.